Today we commemorate the abolition of the slave trade. And in this half hour, we reflect on what took place during that period. You are watching Jamaica Magazine, and I am Adrian Atkinson. Also in the show, measures to ensure learning takes place among deaf students and protect endangered birds. Stay with us. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your GIS News for Thursday, August 23. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is encouraging Jamaicans to embrace the new primary exit profile, PEP, as an opportunity to transform the island into a knowledge-based society. This 2018-2019 academic year, PEP will replace the Grade 6 Achievement Test, GSAT, as the National Secondary School Placement Examination. To be sat over a three-year period, starting at grade four, PEP is intended to provide a complete profile of students' academic and critical thinking at the primary level. While acknowledging that PEP is a departure from GSAT in its teaching and assessment, Prime Minister Holness is confident that PEP will be better for the country and generations to come. I think generally that the PEP exam will create a new type of Jamaica. One that has a more curious mind, one that is looking more for solutions rather than being pedantic. So I want to use this platform to encourage Jamaica to embrace the new exam, not to fear it. It will be better for everyone. Prime Minister Holness was speaking Wednesday as he presented back-to-school gift vouchers to 10 children of staff members of the offices of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. $380 million has been committed to bolster the Education Ministry's expanded pilot rural transportation project for the 2018-2019 academic year. Now in its second year, the program is being implemented in the rural sections of 12 parishes, excluding Kingston and St. Andrew. Spearheaded by the Ministry's Safety and Security in Schools Unit, the project is targeting 7,500 students from 260 schools this upcoming academic year. Consideration is given to students with disabilities and those who are on the PATH program. And through a partnership with local route taxis and buses, Plans are now in place to increase rural students' access to transportation. Schools are tasked to negotiate with, identify route operators within the local where school is that has the reputation and the vehicles and the necessary documents makes them eligible to participate. Project officer Richard Troop was speaking at the first in a series of island-wide parent sensitization sessions organized by the Ministry of Education. The Consumer Affairs Commission is calling on parents to use its price inquiry tool portal when purchasing textbooks for the upcoming academic year. The portal, which can be accessed at cac.gov.jm, has information from the Commission's recently conducted annual textbook survey. This year's survey reports that there's been a 2% increase in the average price for textbooks. The information was gathered between July 23 and 27 from 90 bookstores across the island. National Security State Minister Rudyard Spencer is encouraging more juveniles in correctional institutions to take up training offered through the We Transform program. We Transform provides academic and vocational courses, life skills training, mentorship, internship, and job placement. According to Minister Spencer, the program will prepare the juveniles to seamlessly reintegrate into society. We want to ensure that you leave here significantly better than when you came in. We want to ensure that when you leave here, you are ready for the open society to make your contributions. And I'm sure most of you are willing to do that. 
Minister Spencer was addressing the opening ceremony of the We Transform Sports Day at the Rio Cobra Juvenile Correctional Center on Tuesday. The We Transform program was launched in June last year and is being implemented in four juvenile centers through the Department of Correctional Services. And finally, the Tourism Ministry has begun discussions with locally based embassies to provide foreign language training to hospitality workers. Minister Edmund Bartlett says instructions in French, Chinese and German will be offered in the first phase of the program. This, he says, is in line with the ministry's thrust to increase tourist arrivals from these markets. We want to change the entire labor market arrangements in Jamaica, in so far as it relates to the tourism sector. And to do that, we have to build capacity. We have to train, 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 train our people certify them, take them to the highest levels of their professional uh, capabilities. Minister Bartlett was speaking following a three-hour Spanish training course for Rio Palace Hotel workers in St. James recently. The training was offered through a partnership between the Ministry of Tourism and the Embassy of Spain in Jamaica. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. This is Romain Virgo. I'm your appeal to all of the youths them to just stay away from crime and violence. We know the temptation, the money, the fast life. People say them rate you. But that will only take you nowhere. If you stay in school and focus, then you can achieve anything. Be your own leader. A gang is a dead end. A message from the Ministry of National Security. The Ministry of Education has been putting the requisite tools in place to create a learning environment for children with special needs. Education Officer in the Special Education Unit, Christina Addington, tells us about those measures for deaf children. So much has been done by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information to advance learning of deaf students. And with me to talk about these achievements is Education Officer within the Ministry, Christina Addington. Welcome, Mrs. Addington. Thanks for having me. Tell me a bit about the different stages of hearing loss and how it affects the ability to learn in the traditional school system. Okay, well, Andrew, hearing loss occurs on a continuum based um, going from hard of hearing to deafness. Um, and on this continuum, there are very if there are different levels so we start off with a mild hearing loss then you can have a moderate loss a severe loss or a profound loss it's important to note that it is the level of loss being experienced that, by the child that really impacts on if the child is able to be educated in the traditional system or if the child has to be educated in a segregated system for children who uh, experience mild hearing losses, for the most part, they're able to cope and experience success in the, the regular school system. Um, but for this to happen, there have to be a couple factors that have to be in place. Um, firstly, the student has to be amplified, fitted with hearing aids. The child has to be in a small school setting, most importantly, in a small class size so that there is not a lot of background information to distort information being shared between teacher and the students in the classroom environment. Um, another thing is the teacher working with a child has to ensure that she or he utilizes specific strategies that will help the child maximize whatever residual hearing that the child has. So things like placing the child at the front of the class um, the teacher has to also remember he or she cannot turn their backs to the class while teaching. They have to ensure that they always have the child's attention, let them know, let the child know when they're speaking to them. And the greatest thing I think also is that the parents have to be very, very involved because once there's great parent involvement, 
um, in the educational life of the child with a mild loss, then this will better ensure success. So Mrs. Addington, how many specialized schools are there for these students? Well, um, to date we have seven special education schools for the deaf across the island in Jamaica. We have three public schools which are operated um, in partnership between the Ministry of Education and the Jamaica Association for the Deaf. These are the Danny Williams School for the Deaf. They are in Kingston in Pope Estate, Papine, and they have two satellites. One, a preschool center which is attached to the school and another unit class at the Excelsior Primary School. The St. Christopher School for the Deaf is also a primary school and that school is in Brownstown, St. Anne, and it has a boarding facility. And Lister Mayor Gilby High School for the Deaf is the high school for the deaf. And that school has two satellites, so they have a satellite in Maypen and they have a satellite in Fort Antonio. The other four schools are private schools. Um, they are the Caribbean Christian Center for the Deaf. They operate three schools, one in St. James, one in Manchester, and one in Kingston. And the Jamaica Christian School for the Deaf, and they operate in Lethe, St. James. So how has the ministry been advancing the learning of these students in these particular institutions? Well, the ministry has been playing its part. Um, for the most part, there is greater interaction and greater support to the public schools. Um, one of the things that um, the ministry has done a couple of years ago, through discussions, the special education unit lobbied for posts of teachers' assistants to be established for the schools, special schools, and so the schools for the deaf, all the schools for the deaf, um, public schools, they got teachers' assistants. It's important to note that these teachers' assistants, they're not called teachers' assistants in the schools for the deaf, but they're called deaf culture facilitators. So although their role is to assist in helping the teachers to bring across the concepts, they also have another, which is a more important role, which is they are the deaf models for the children. The children are deaf, they are de deaf, so the children have models and they display the culture, the deaf culture. So then and there, the children are seeing and learning about their culture and learning that it is okay to be deaf. They're deaf and it's a part of life and how they can um, succeed. The ministry also has put in place um, quality education circles and all the schools for the deaf are engaged in a quality education circle. So the principals meet with um, administrators from other schools, they share information and so the principals are able to learn and, and get advice and, and share information. The high school for the deaf has benefited from being placed on the e-learning Jamaica project and so all the teachers there have been trained and are better equipped to you know infuse the technology into the teaching learning process. So what are the advantages of learning in these specialized institutions? Main advantage I would say is um, at the schools for the deaf the pupil teacher ratio is eight to one. So we talk about eight students to one teacher. Now when you compare that with a regular school system where it's one to 35, but in most cases one to 40 or, or some more, we can say that the children in, are in a, in a setting which um, makes concessions that they cannot hear. So they need more time to be spent um, interacting, engaging in you know, learning. That the teachers for the most part in these institutions are special education trained. So the teachers are trained in deaf education um, and while in school they, they have what they call in-service training where the Jamaica Association for Deaf provides training in them gaining Jamaican Sign Language competence. So we know that the teachers you know, are being trained to effectively communicate with the children. So they're getting the, the information because it's being effectively passed on to them in a manner which they understand. The methodologies used are methodologies which are specific 
for enhancing learning with the population. Um, and, and as I say, you know, small setting, persons know and better understand them and are better able to work with them. Perfect note to end on and signs for you to follow up on. We want to thank Mrs. Christina Addington from the Special Education Unit in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information for sharing with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, until next time, see you around. No son, a verb is an action word. Parents need to become more involved in their children's education. Parents are the first and in many cases the most important teachers. Read with your children, review their schoolwork, visit their school. Tapping and rapping and slapping, I said. Nice, high five. Woo. <laughs> a good education will never decay. Bird shooting is a hobby for some persons, and while it may be full of excitement, one must note and abide by the regulations that are in place to protect endangered species. In our next feature, we highlight game reserves. Here, birds are at rest. Wild animals make their home. The inquisitive eye gets its full share of rich colors, and at times, man and animal venture into a game of hide-and-seek. A game reserve is a protected area of land where birds are um, would you know be, it would part of their habitat where they would nest and so on and it's not legal to shoot in those areas. A game reserve is an area that um, the birds do their nesting. A game reserve is a place where the birds them, them, them live there. It's where people hunt birds and things like that. I don't remember anymore. A game reserve is a place that I can't go. You're not allowed to shoot there, you're not allowed to fish there, you're not allowed to do anything to destroy the environment there. A game reserve is a parcel of land or body of water or an area comprising both land and water within which the hunting of birds or any other animals is strictly prohibited. It's also illegal to bring into these game reserves any weapons or dogs for hunting or even to take the nest of a bird. In Jamaica, game reserves are monitored by the National Environment and Planning Agency. Game reserves are like a refuge for, for game birds in particular, where they can escape all the hunting activities that are occurring on the island. They are also good roosting areas and breeding areas for these birds. In addition, some of these areas are also areas where a lot of endangered birds are and we actually don't want any hunting activities in there in case there is accidental or um, illegal hunting of these birds. A lot of these game reserves um, do have many other species there. Another endangered species that's come to mind when we speak of wetlands for example is the endangered American crocodile and we know a lot of people have some fear of the crocodile and we just don't want that human crocodile interactions because the crocodile always comes out on the losing end. So it's always good to ensure that these areas are no shooting areas, no hunting areas. Forest reserves are also considered game reserves as well. There are 19 game reserves across the island and we are currently at the Amity Hall and Goat Island game reserves and this one in particular is, is, of, is a little interesting in that it's the only game reserve that incorporates both land and a body of water. Over here is actually a part of the game reserve and in the background there, that's the Great Goat Island. And so between the mainland here and the Great Goat Island, this body of water is also a no shooting area. So other than this, where are the other game reserves located on the island? There is the Great Morass Game Reserve in Holland Bay, St. Thomas. In St. Catherine, the Portmore and Greater Portmore and Cabarita Point Game Reserves. In Clarendon, 
the Long Island, West Harbor Peak Bay, and Mason River Savannah Game Reserves. Bordering on Clarendon and Manchester is the Alligator Pond, Gut River, and Canoe Valley Game Reserves. Also in Manchester is the Rygate Game Reserve. Over in St. Elizabeth, there is the Black River Upper and Lower Morass Game Reserves, as well as the Parity, Great Morass, and Stanmore Hill Game Reserves. Bordering on Westmoreland and Hanover in the Grill, there is the Great Morass Game Reserve. In Montego Bay, St. James, there is the Bogue Lagoon Creek Game Reserve, while over in the west, in the parish of Trelawney, is the Glistening Waters Game Reserve. Portland is home to the Fairy Hill Port Antonio Game Reserve, while St. Anne, Jamaica's Garden Parish, has the Knapdale Game Reserves. There is also the Kingston and St. Andrew Game Reserves. On our NEPA website, for example, you can actually find maps of all these game reserves. And it's, it's important for, for persons to, be, to, to know exactly where they are, because sometimes people would create new tracks and there won't be a sign necessarily at that new track. Um, so it's important to, to know exactly where you are. You're not allowed to hunt there. And if I was to go in there with my weapon to hunt and you found me, I could go to jail. So I won't go in there. No shooting zone. You can't shoot there. If never catch you, you go to jail. That's right. These hunters know the law well, which declares that any person found in a game reserve in possession of any animal, bird, bird's eggs, or nests will be presumed to be in violation of the Wildlife Protection Act. This can attract a maximum fine of $100,000, 12 months imprisonment, or both, if convicted by a resident magistrate. So for each game reserve, there is actually a buffer around the game reserve of 50 meters. So persons are asked, are required to observe a 50 meter zone around each game reserve where no hunting is allowed or no trapping of, of birds or animals is allowed. We are along the edge of the Amity Hall and Goat Island Game Reserve. And this is actually the boundary, one of the boundary lines, this canal right here. And so no hunting is allowed within 50 meters of this canal and everything over here is actually a part of the game reserve where no hunting is allowed. There are signs at the entrance to game reserves. Identifying one is an easy feat. For more information on game reserves, contact the National Environment and Planning Agency at 754-7540 or visit their website at nepa.gov.jm. Today is International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its abolition is commemorated every year on this day, August 23. Up next, a pic from our archives showcasing what took place during that era. nothing called humanity on board those ships. The journey between Mother Africa and the West Indies, the Middle Passage, sheer horror. The Middle Passage lasted anywhere between six to ten weeks, depending on the weather and destination. The journey would end at any of the main slave markets in the Caribbean, Barbados, Martinique, Hispaniola, and Jamaica. The mortality rate on the Middle Voyage was high. Approximately 13% to 33% of the slaves died. The dense, close, and inhumane manner in which slaves were packed on the deck in box-like trays, 150 centimeters long and 50 centimeters wide and high, led to frequent epidemic outbreaks and diseases. Shackled with iron to their ankles and joined by loops of chains to their neighbors, these Africans, frightened, naked, and broken, were considered nothing but cargo by their ship's crew and the men who awaited their arrival. There were those who survived the Middle Passage, but for them, the worst was yet to come.
them look at me as a slave. Them see my strength for their benefit. It is for their progress I work. So them panda, plan, and plot for me. On the sugar plantation, work was divided among three or four gangs, each with its own driver and cook. The driver was the highest position among the slaves, and he had permission to use the whip whenever he thought it was necessary. The first gang, or great gang, was the largest group, consisting of the strongest males and females. The female slaves mostly did cultivation work in the fields, while the men worked in the more skilled area of manufacturing, positions such as coopers, markers of barrels and casks, boilermen, smiths, and carpenters. The second gang was made up of teenagers, the elderly and weak, pregnant women, and slaves recovering from illnesses. They were responsible for weeding, collecting, and spreading manure. The third gang was of children four to ten years old. Under the watchful eyes of an old slave woman, they were responsible for weeding and collecting food for the animals, including the hogs, which is how they became known as the Hogmeat Gang. Ah, boy. This plantation living no nice. Cut, key, and feed animal work money noon and night. Ah, boy. This no nice. For the slave, a typical day began about 4 a.m. The white overseer or estate manager or the driver would ring the bell or blow the conch shell. Before going out to the fields, the slaves would carry mold to the cattle pens, cut up dung, make mortar, carry white lime to the boiling house, or do various odd jobs in preparation for the tradesmen. A roll call was taken, and they worked until 10 a.m., followed by a half an hour for breakfast, with work resuming until 12 noon, and then it was time for lunch, which lasted two hours. Although work was supposed to have ended at 6.30 or 7 p.m., there were many extra tasks to perform. A slave was at the beck and call of his master. There was always work, and there was always abuse, especially at crop time, when the mills had to be kept running day and night. Me tired. Oh, me tired. My blood, sweat, and tears. For what? For who? This is madness. I'm tired of this. I'm not going to have another straw. They better just kill me now. Just kill me now. As we close today's show, we ask that you stay connected via our website, jis.gov.jn. And while you're online, send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm or via tweet at JIS News. On behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.